just lovely. Um, okay, so um, we would before we start formally, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather. So the traditional owners of the country on which BBI Tate stands, the Dahrig people, we would like to acknowledge them and pay respects to the elders past and present of the Dahrig people, extending that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people past and present, as well as First Nations people from around the world. We wish to acknowledge they hold the memories, the traditions and okay. cultural history of oh. their land. We now invite you to silently acknowledge the traditional owners of the First Nation people in the country where you are gathered. You may like to name them on the chat. Thank you, everyone. It is now my great pleasure to invite Phyllis to talk to us about her upcoming book. Phyllis, as you will all know, is a very respected scholar and um, feminist writer with a particular interest in the early church. And um, Phyllis has been doing a lot of work both in her own scholarship and also with the Vatican around deacons and the um, place and the position and the evidence of, of women deacons in the church. Um, so I would like to, with our most heartiest congratulations on this new book, Phyllis, I would like to turn the microphone over to you and welcome you to this talk. Well, thank you, thank you so much. You know. Uh... I haven't been, I've only been to Australia once uh, eight years ago and was in Sydney and I was in Melbourne and I wish you greetings. I've also been to California and Chicago and New Jersey and the other places folks are, are, are coming to us from. Um, um, Mary and I are, are gonna have a little conversation about this book, but I can uh, uh, tell you that it's, uh, um, it's, it's an interesting little book. And if you can see it, um, I'll just tell you about the cover. The cover is, uh, is the Annunciation, and it's, it's done by um, uh, Antonella de Messina. It hangs in, in, uh, in, in um, Palermo, Italy, uh, and it's done in the 15th century. But the interesting thing, and I don't think you can see it too well, but I'll hold it up here. Um, this is the Annunciation. She is standing at a lectern, and she is reading a book. And it's almost as if uh, she is saying, uh, wait, wait a minute, we need to discuss this a little more, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and it's a picture of Mary that I actually saw in person in Palermo. There's a great photo of me standing next to her, but uh, it also traveled to New York where I first saw it. So the, the book is Women Icons of Christ. And I had the opportunity to chat a little bit with Mary Colo just before we came, we came on and uh, she wants to know about the title. So uh, if Mary doesn't mind, I'll just talk a little bit about how I got the title and then we can throw it over to Mary and she can, uh, she can grill me. Um, uh, you, you know that I was on the uh, first papal commission for the study of the diaconate of women, which, to which I was named in August of uh, 2016, 2016. And uh, during the time of the commission, we, uh, we had uh, uh, opportunity to meet members of the staff of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. We actually uh, met in their offices. Uh, and I lived in the uh, Casa Santa Marta, the, the residence of the Holy Father. And uh, after the meetings, typically we would go for dinner at lunchtime, uh, the second meeting at, to, to the uh, uh, Casa Santa Marta. And one day I was there, I mean, link, big long, um, big long, uh, uh, table of, of uh, people. And I was across from a uh, uh, member of the CDF staff who uh, said, I said, why can't women be ordained uh, as deacons? He said, because women can't image Christ. A and I said, um, watch me. 
So that's where the title came. It's called Women Icons of Christ. And, and uh, if, it's, uh, if it's helpful to you, um, uh, it's, 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 a, uh, it's, a, it's a good little book. It's, it's arranged around uh, uh, various sacraments, sacraments that women are able to receive, but also sacraments that women have given. But let, let's ask, have Mary ask some questions and we can uh, uh, get, get on with it. Yeah, thanks, Phyllis. Well, my, my first question is, what moved you to publish this book now? Uh, did it come out of your experience on that Vatican committee? Well, that's interesting. I started writing it before uh, I was named to the commission. And then I had to drop everything. Uh, and actually for two years during the term of the commission, I was named in August of 2016, as I said, and we finished our work in late June, 2018. Uh, during that time, I, I really, I was asked actually not to give public lectures. I turned down 45 invitations for public lectures all around the world. Um, but I, I really just worked on, on, the, on this topic and I did not want to confuse things. I did not want to confuse um, what I was doing uh, for the paper for the Holy Father with my own research. Uh, because uh, the paper we were writing for the Holy Father was just for him. Uh, it wasn't to be published. Uh, it wasn't uh, uh, and for anything except to, for his information. So, um, so that's, that's kind of why it took so long to write, uh, but it's also why I finished. Hmm. Okay. If, then Phyllis, <coughs> could you name any particular texts that were key? in this question of uh, the ordination of women to the diaconate? Any main texts you are examining in your book? Well, it's not really a scripture study. The, the scriptures, there are a few little scripture uh, passages that mention women. Deacons Phoebe, of course, mm. is the, uh, the only person in, in, uh, in, in scripture with the job title uh, mm. deacon. She, mm. It is she who carried the... Uh, uh, the uh, letter to the Romans. And then you have in 1 Timothy 3 to 11, you have this section where the, the discussion is about deacons, what, you know, what deacons are supposed to do. And then in the middle of it, it says, and the women also. Oh. So that, that clearly means uh, the, the women deacons. And, and he, there's a footnote, there's a footnote in this book, and there's a footnote to the USCCB, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, um, uh, uh, a scripture uh, passage that says this is clearly about women deacons. If it was deaconesses, if it was deaconesses, or if it was wives of deacons, it would be their women also, not you know. And, and so there's that. Um, the uh, uh, the passage in Acts uh, where uh, the apostles uh, realize they can't do everything. Um, the passage in Acts where the seven, the first seven, are called. Well, that, that's a symbolic number, the first seven. But the important thing is that the, uh, it is the assembly, it is the people of the church, the people of the ecclesia who have uh, uh, nominated the individuals to be deacons. So, so when, when you think of it, these, these are really the, the three pieces of scripture um, that discuss what eventually became the diaconate. And the diaconate, as you know, Mary, uh, uh, predates the priesthood. Yes. Uh, so uh, we find that the apostles and their successors, the, the episcopi, the bishops, uh, the, the episcopacy uh, needed help and, and the help was given by the deacons. I mean, it's, it's basically uh, how, how it all evolved. And it, it takes a, at least a century, century and a half uh, to develop any kind of a priesthood. Yeah, that's right. That, that comes really in the, <clears throat> in the next century because it from my work on the New Testament, there's no one named priest in the New Testament, except in a symbolic sense, talking of Jesus as the high priest. But apart from, apart from Jesus, there is no other person named priest because there is no ordination, but there still is Eucharist. So uh, you talked about deacon and deaconess. In your research, how do you make the distinction between a woman named deacon and a woman named deaconess 
Is there a distinction? Well, there can be, uh, and, and we don't know what happened every place and every time in history. Uh, most of the epigraphical, the tombstone evidence we have, a lot of the literary evidence we have, uh, the women are called deacon. Uh, Phoebe is deacon yes. uh, in, in, in scripture. Uh, and, and I like to say that uh, uh, it's a job title. And if you call a plumber and a lady shows up, you don't call her a plumeress. So, <laughs> so we have, we have the, uh, the deacon, uh, we have that job title. Now, if you have that job title, and uh, your language develops and different languages uh, developed uh, differently. For example, in the Georgian language, there is no gender. In English, there's really no gender. Um, so, but some languages really developed so that nouns had gender. So, uh, and, and also nouns became gendered. Mm. So Italian, I am, if somebody calls me professoressa, I, I don't have a heart attack because that's the way Italian works. I'm not professori, I'm professoressa. So, um, although that's getting, they're getting away from that actually. Uh, so a lot of people will say that, if, excuse me, a lot of people will say that the deaconess is the wife of the deacon and sometimes she is. Um, sometimes she's the wife of the, of the bishop, but that doesn't mean that she's not an ordained deacon. Oh. So um, we don't know. The ones we know who were ordained deacons are the ones for whom we have the evidence. We certainly have a lot of liturgical evidence that there were ordination ceremonies. Um, and actually in this book, I have, I have the, the very few whom we can identify with uh, the ceremony, uh, their name, the ceremony, and the bishop who ordained them. Uh -huh. So... Uh, having, having said that, uh, uh, you know, uh, history alone is not just positive, so it does. Mm -hmm. it yes. Phyllis, the other issue is sometimes a woman who's called deacon, that translation is actually hidden when it gets translated. Uh, so I've seen a, a stone in, it's in Jerusalem, it's in a museum, from around 321, and it's a woman named Sophie the Deacon, the second Phoebe. Yes. That's what it says in Greek. Yes. But the little inscription above it calls her Sophie the Deaconess. And that's not what the um, inscription actually says. So it gets hidden. And then you mentioned the letter to the Romans, where uh, Phoebe is... Uh, the translation of deacon is often servant or patron. Uh, so the translations have done a good job at hiding women. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I, you've done the studies. I, you know, I agree. I mean, what else am I going to say? The, the, uh, the language, uh, as I said, uh, not only uh, as, as the uh, development of language it came to the term deaconess, you also have people who, when they're doing their translation, um, uh, can't imagine that the female would be called deacon and just, you know, because of whatever their cultural act, you know, is that they call them deaconess. I, I don't get heartburn over it. Uh, uh, the Holy Father has spoken to me about deaconesses. I, I don't correct him, you know, <laughs> because uh, he knows what I'm talking about and, and he knows that I know that he knows what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> I'm not allowed to tell them off. <laughs> no. Do you think the commission you were on offers a sign of hope to women? Has it moved the discussion along in a positive way? Well, I can't, you know, I can't, I can't judge that. I can tell you that there has been um, repeated waves of interest in it, a witness that you've got 141 people right now signed on, 142 um, for this discussion from basically all over the world. Um, uh, there are groups of people uh, gathering together to uh, discern the vocation to the diaconate for mm. women. Mm. There are individuals who are asking their bishops uh, to ordain them. Uh, in terms of, of bringing hope, I think there's always hope. You know, the Holy Father uh, is uh, a man of dis deep discernment and I would, I would think that he is, uh, he is waiting for the, uh, the right time for the church to, uh, uh, to, to speak. 
And the church is not a democracy. You know, during the Amazon Synod, uh, nine of the 12 language groups asked uh, the Synod, uh, actually asked the Holy Father, the report of the Synod was, you know, we want women deacons. We want women installed as lectors. We want women installed as, as acolytes. And we, we would like uh, to consider women deacons. Uh, and the Holy Father said, yes, I've heard what you said. I, you've thrown down the gauntlet. I will pick it up. And he said he would uh, name a new commission. Oh, no, he, first he said he would add, he said he would add uh, three people to my commission. And uh, so I didn't say anything for a while. And then on April 8th of this past year, um, he uh, named a whole new commission. He, he named uh, 10, five men, five women, a priest secretary and a Cardinal Archbishop of Aquila, uh, south of Rome as the uh, chair. And uh, so in terms of hope, well, he's certainly continuing the commission, the, the study, he's continuing the work of the commission. He had turned over a portion of our report to the International Union of Superiors General, which asked for the commission. They have not published it. And he has uh, uh, certainly heard what the Amazon Synod said. But if I can re re revert to the question of hope, um, you know, uh, hope is the promise of th things that we uh, that we that are attainable, and so we know that the the uh, diaconate is attainable uh, for women. Uh, it's clearly documented in history. It's clearly been asked uh, for by the majority of the bishops in the Amazon Synod. Um, it's clearly something that um, the Church has a. Uh, an almost reflexive acceptance to. Uh -huh. uh, and I, I know that uh, people that I talk to, some are like, how come we haven't heard about this? Well, part of it's bad education, but part of it is the boys don't want you to know. So um, uh -huh. so I, I think there's always hope. I, 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 uh, I, I don't think I'm Pollyannish about it. Uh, I might be a little too close to it, but I can't imagine that the Holy Father has been disingenuous in this and is simply uh, having uh, death by commission, which is okay. something that has been said to me, or uh, an enemy of the Holy Father said, oh, Phyllis, he's just playing with you. He has no intentions of, uh, of having women deacons. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but the other things that that person has said about the Holy Father gives me great pause on his, his opinion. The wisdom, yes. Phyllis, I notice um, that in your speaking, your writing for NCR and in your book, uh, you put forward the position of women's ordination to the diaconate, but you don't speak about the ordination to the priesthood. Why is that? Well, I discuss this in my book. The, first of all, the diaconate and the priesthood are not really related. Um, and secondly, there's really minimal evidence of women called presbyter or presbyteress or presbyter, presbyteress, I guess, um, but no evidence of their having been ordained. And uh, so you get back to the question of, well, were these women the wives of priests? And, and clearly today in the Orthodox churches, the wife of a priest is called the presbyteress. So, okay. uh, uh, but I, I think it confuses the issue, and and uh, we know that in 1976 with uh, Inter and Signores, in 1994 with Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, and a year later with the Responsum ad Dubium, that the Church feels uh, it does not have the authority to ordain women as deacons, and so when people say, uh, as excuse me, does not have the authority to ordain women as priests. So when people say to me oh, if you can ordain a woman a deacon, you can ordain a woman a priest. I say, okay, I'm stupid, I agree. Because you either agree or you don't agree with what the church teaches. So if you're saying to me, a woman can't be ordained a deacon because she can't be ordained a priest, then, then you, you seem not to agree with church teaching uh, there. Uh, women, women cannot, if, you, if you agree that women cannot be ordained as priests, then don't worry about it. Um, and I, and I think it really redounds to a misunderstanding of the, the cursus honorum, the course of honor, which really became legislated, became law around the 12th century. Um, and it's really derived from the Roman political military system mm. where you had to go through steps and oh. you were conjured, you became a lector, a porter, uh, uh, an 
exorcist and acolyte, all these minor orders for which you were blessed in the sac sac sanctuary in sacristy. And then in the sanctuary at the, at the time of the mass, um, you were ordained a subdeacon, deacon, and then priest. But by the time the cursus on norm became solidified, uh, no one, women were not, were not in the cursus on norm. Women were not being ordained as deacons except for in their monasteries and abbeys. And no one was allowed to be, eventually no one was allowed to be ordained a deacon unless he and only he could become a priest. So <clears throat> it's really the 12th century that has this all fouled up here. Yes. Um, and, and it's in 1972 that uh, Paul VI got rid of the, suppressed the minor orders, uh, created the installed ministries of lector and acolyte to which only men are installed now, even though in 2008, this is in the book, in 2008, there was a Senate that says, yeah, we should allow women to be uh, installed as lectors and acolyte. And so did the Senate in 2019 say, mm -hmm. you know, allow women to be installed. So um, it's, it's the problem of, of not distinguishing orders. Okay. So in my writing and in my research, I really have distinguished the orders. And okay. there's, there's really minimal uh, minimal discussion about, you know, you, you always say, oh, Theodora the bishop, and, you mm -hmm. know, maybe she was, I, but yeah. it's, it's, it's not, it's not material to the work I'm doing, because as I said earlier, what was just, what, it, uh, the history is not, alone is not just positive. The question is, do we need women to be ordained as deacons? Mm -hmm. uh, not can they be ordained as deacons, because it's obvious that you can. I mean, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. it, Oh, okay. Thanks, Phyllis. Um, and I think this might be a good time to see if there are other questions coming through in the chat. Uh, and you're in charge of that. So you might like to put some other questions to Phyllis that have come through to you. Yes. Now, I sent a few through to you, but would you like me to articulate them? Yes, please. Okay. Um, okay. So I have to find, <laughs> I have to find them from where I sent them. Um, there was a, an interesting one from Danielle. In fact, Danielle, if you're there, I might get you to answer it because it's got a couple of questions in the one question, I think. Sure thing. I was asking if the Pope is waiting for the right time, will our time ever come? What needs to change to make it the right time? And surely the, the signs of the times are there to be seen in our broader society. Well, Danielle, I think the Holy Father has a lot of other things on his mind. Um, He's trying to straighten out the finances, obviously. He's trying to uh, um, uh, straighten out really horrific things that have gone on in the Vatican. <clears throat> and I, I think, this is what I think. Uh, he has the, um, the reform of the Curia, and that paper is pretty much done. Uh, once he, he finishes that, it needs to be published. Once he publishes it, we find out that there are different courier offices that have been um, upgraded, downgraded here, there, and everywhere. After he does that, he will then have to replace a lot of people in the courier. <clears throat> now, if you're going to downgrade somebody's office, you're not going to um, uh, you're not going to put in a, a person into an office now that will later be downgraded. So all of that has to happen. He also has to re release what's called the McCarrick Report. Uh, cardinal McCarrick <coughs> is an American uh, cardinal who's actually been laicized because of sex crimes and misdemeanors. And uh, that report is very big and very thick and very footnoted. And it's apparently finished. Uh, and we don't know when that's going to be, be put out. I think he also needs to, or he wishes to, um, maintain his relations with the uh, <laughs> with the, excuse me, with the, um, the Orthodox churches. Now in 2004, Bartholomew, uh, His Old Holiness Bartholomew, the Patriarch of, of Constantinople said he saw no reason not to uh, include women as a diacon, as deacons. So uh, your question is, when is the right time? Uh, I've told them they better hurry up. Um, um, they better um, hurry up <laughs> to do it soon because women are walking away. Uh, women have just about had it. Um, and uh, I'm told that the Synod in 2022 <clears throat> will include um, women. Oh, it's on the agenda. I said, guys, women are not going to be in the church in 2022. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I certainly write and, and speak and, and do what I do. 
and uh, we can just uh, <clears throat> just hope that we can explain to the Holy Father that maybe it'd be a good idea to move. Mm, definitely. It seems to me, Phyllis, that uh, much of the church's history has been very influenced by Aristotelian philosophy, which had women as almost subhuman. And it really wasn't until good biology, good anthropology, which came as late as 1873, uh, that women made it into the human race participating in procreation. And that, that perception that women did not contribute to procreation really kept women uh, at, a, at a lower status as a human being throughout the Greek world. And that then influenced um, European thinking, influenced church thinking. Um, yeah, and, and we're still there. Mm -hmm. My uh, main reason why I see women are not being ordained uh, into the diaconate or into the priesthood is that uh, men make up the rules. <laughs> what else have we got there, Anne? Yeah, that's that. Turning my phone off. Um, yes, Mary, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I think that anyone would think that even given that was the situation, the Aristotelian thinking, that baptism in Christ was something that overturned that but it would seem not all the time oh, oh. okay so elizabeth young's got an interesting question um, elizabeth would you like to ask it or would you like me to ask it sure thanks anne and thanks very much phyllis for your talk and all that you're doing um i was just wondering whether or what might be the next steps if pope francis or a future pope or a commission were to give the okay at that level vatican level what would happen then? Would the national bishops conferences, local dioceses, what would you see as possibly the next steps? Right, I, I think it would be, um, I thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. I think what would happen uh, would be, it would have to be the Pope who would direct a change to the law. Um, and all he has to do is Canon 1024 say only a baptized male is validly ordained as priest because everybody's kind of agreed on that. And that frees them up to ordain women as deacons. Uh, but the way the diaconate rolled out after the Second Vatican Council was it was up to the bishops' conferences, the Episcopal Conference. So the uh, the uh, bishops' conference of, of Australia is it Australia and New Zealand or just the bishops? Australia, of Australia. Australia would have to ask, uh, say, we want women deacons, and then it would come back say, okay. And then it would be up to individual bishops to decide if they wanted or needed uh, women ordained as deacons in their diocese. Just as today, it's up to the bishop of a given diocese to decide whether he wants a male deacon ordained in his diocese. And, it's, and he is the final word in terms of uh, within, within parameters about training uh, and, and ordination. The, um, <clears throat> you know, I always think of John, John of Salamis, you'll remember him uh, from... <laughs> from maybe the fifth century. Um, and, and there's an interesting exchange of letters between two bishops in the fifth century in adjoining diocese. And one fellow writes to the other, he says, I know you don't like women deacons, so I don't let mine go as missionaries to your diocese. I mean, <laughs> that's really as simple as that. Yeah. Um, and so it, 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 it does depend, uh, as, as was said earlier, on uh, on the authority of the bishop, um, and, and I've just been asked to write in a journal in India about the question of authority, that the authority of the bishop, but we give our, the authority over to the bishop. And the problem in the Catholic Church uh, from through the eyes of, of women is that all the authority is held by men. And, and the Holy Father has spoken uh, not so much in terms of governance and jurisdictional authority, but more in terms of pastoral authority uh, with the uh, Quirid Amazonia, his response to the final document of the Amazon Synod, where he, um, he said, you know, um, it's important to uh, have the, the laity running the parishes, basically. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, and uh, I think it's paragraph 94. He, he references Canon 5, uh, 517, paragraph 2, which uh, allows for uh, parish life, uh, pastoral life, uh, uh, pastoral life administrators, pastoral life, P PLF, pastoral life 
Mm, it's gone out of my head. Um, P pastoral life coordinators, PLCs, pa parish, parish life coordinators. And these can be deacons or lay people, married, single, uh, male, female. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we go back to the, to the Amazon, uh, while two thirds of the parishes and parish groupings in the Amazonian area um, are, are run by women religious, we find there's thousands of parishes that are priestless there. So his idea is really brilliant. He's saying, take people who are already there, who are already ministering, who know the culture, who know the language, make them the managers, make them the parish life coordinators, make them the ones that are governed, that are managing the life of the parish, and then worry about the sacramental needs separately. If, if Sister Mary uh, is, is in a parish and she has the language and she's been running the parish for years and she has a vocation of the diaconate, that's different, fine. But if she doesn't have a vocation to the diaconate, that's okay too, because we want her still to run the parish. His point is to the bishop saying, let the people who are running the parishes have a position, have, a, um, have a, an official position, a permanent position, uh, a rotating permanent position, almost like, I don't know, in the Americas, you, you, you are your last six years as a pastor. But, but let these people have some kind of professional authority. I, th I think that, that's a professional acknowledgement and a pay, <clears throat> and pay. Because uh, uh, until you do that, um, you're still parachuting people in without the culture, without the language. They happen to be men, they happen to be priests, and just because they're priests, poof, they're the pastor. And it just doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't work like that. Along with that, Phyllis, comes the, um, I, I call it the starving of the people for, for lack of Eucharist, that uh, until something is done to, that recognises the, the, that all of us who are baptised in Christ participate in that priesthood and to allow people to lead the Eucharistic celebrations, uh, I, I just see the church as being starved of Eucharist. And this time uh, of COVID, when many of us have had to look to alternatives for our Eucharist experience, uh, I think we're going to emerge from this as a very different church. Mm. Yes, Mary, I think I agree with you. That was a great question, Elizabeth. Um, look, we're running, we, we do have 140 and it's 138. So given that we're here to congratulate and celebrate and pick Phyllis's brains about her book, I've had a great question come through from Carmel. Um, and I'm not sure which Carmel it is. So if she'll forgive me, I'll ask it. Um, uh, Carmel's asking you, Mary, what are the three takeaways that you would like the 140 people listening to you here today um, to take with them after this session? Me? Oh, excuse me. Well, I was, you. Yes, oh, right. I was just getting, you cannot have a book launch without um, a, a toast. Oh, well, I'll, I'll let you toast after Phyllis has asked, answered the question, Mary. Okay, all right. You just asked Mary. Um, did you yes, mean you Mary? Sorry, did I say Mary? My yes. apologies. I'm I'm reading the screen too much. Obviously, Phyllis, I meant to ask you. Well, Phyllis, what would you say are the takeaways? The takeaway is that uh, uh, him history demonstrates, and, and this is on the book uh, in the book. And and I was actually surprised. There was a priest in New Jersey who did a review, a little Vimeo review of the book. Um, uh, and it speaks to what Mary Colo has been speaking about, that uh, history demonstrates the early church had no such difficulties with ordaining women uh, or with women being near the sacred. We haven't touched on that discussion, but the first argument against the uh, possibility of women receiving the sacrament of orders reduces to a less than human status for women. That less than human status for women is echoed in today's headlines as women and girls are routinely disrespected, raped, trafficked, and murdered in every country in the world. Unless the church allows itself to return to its historical respect for women, allows itself to once again sacramentally ordain women, 
the tears, violations, slaveries, and deaths of thousands and thousands of women will be charged against it. Um, I think the takeaway is that until the uh, church says women uh, can image Christ, until the Holy Father has a woman deacon standing next to him um, proclaiming the gospel, uh, until that happens, uh, I will blame the hierarchy uh, for not moving on this because mm -hmm. nothing they say about the value of female life um, uh, will be believed. And, and so I think the takeaway is to explain uh, uh, around the world that women are indeed made in the image and likeness of God, that women indeed can, can image Christ. Thank you, Phyllis. Dor Dorothy Lee had a comment yes. to make. Dorothy, uh, Phyllis, do, 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 Dr. Dor uh, Professor Dorothy Lee is a, a wonderful biblical scholar here in Melbourne, and she also is uh, just about to publish a book on women in the New Testament. So, Dorothy, what's your comment? And and I'm an, an alien too because I'm Anglican, so. Uh... Um, but very close links with the Roman Catholic Church because my daughters are both Catholics um, and, and my granddaughters. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I found it very interesting to read the work of the Orthodox scholar who's now deceased, Elizabeth Bear Seychell, because speaking from a Greek Orthodox perspective, she argues very strongly for women as icons um, of Christ. And... Uh, and one of the things I found I found over the years most fascinating is is the uh, is the picture of Blandina, who's a slave in the yes. um, the persecution in France anyway in the end of the uh, one seventy one somewhere around then um, that she's I mean she's horribly tortured because she's a slave and they can do what they like to her but at one point they hang her up on a stake and and Eusebius tells us that it seemed to her her brothers and sisters that she was as Christ hanging there, giving them the encouragement they needed to, to continue their combat with evil in the arena. And there you have an icon of Christ. Um, and it's a, it's a martyr. And in martyrdom, women were able to be my, my icons of Christ. So if not, if not there, why not at the font and in the pulpit, as well as deacons? And of course, as an Anglican priest myself, I would probably go a step further, but I realise that uh, Roman Catholics, women have to take their own journey and in their own way. Um, but uh, but I think there's just very strong evidence from the tradition right across that women were and are um, icons of Christ. So thank you very much, Phyllis. I haven't read your book yet, but I'm planning to get it now and I'm going to sit down and enjoy it. Well, you know, let me just say one more thing. Thank you very much, uh, Dorothy. Um, two things. One, uh, Elizabeth Bersagel's um, son sent me uh, all of her work <laughs> when oh, she died. And... Uh, and uh, Secondly, you know, there are two study guides for this book, for women uh, icons of Christ, on my website for free download. One is a parish study guide that uh, a par parishioners could get together, pray about the topic, talk about the topic. The other is a teacher's guide for college and high school, um, where um, <clears throat> a teacher can take it and, uh, and use it as, as lecture notes. So, so those are available on my website. I, I, I just hope people will talk about it. I think I, think I, I know that the Holy Father wants, uh, wants this matter discussed. And if it ends up uh, with, with uh, women bishops or women priests, I, I don't think he has that, I don't think he has a problem with that, but I, I think it needs to be discussed. Uh, the problem is certainly in the Courier, which is why I referenced the, uh, the realignment of the Courier with the new apostolic constitution. Uh, and once, once that starts moving and once he starts uh, replacing people in the Korea, I think, uh, I think things might move a little faster. He does have a new, um, he does have a new uh, um, a bunch of, of cardinals coming uh, the 28th of this month in November. Um, and of those 13, uh, one, one is already uh, a member of the Korea. But I, I, I just can see a lot of movement and, and, and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, hopeful things uh, that are happening. Um, so I, you know, I, I, but I, I think he wants people to discuss it. He's a man of discernment, of honest discernment, and he wants the church, uh, church to move. Uh, but I think he, you know, between the Holy Father and 
the people of God, there is the Korea. And, yes. and it can, it can uh, wow. uh, less than, than it has, but as much as it does, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you, Phyllis. We're now reaching the end of our, it seems to have gone far too quickly, and we're now reaching the end of our time. In fact, we've gone a little bit over. Uh -huh. But I think in the interests of, um, of the spirit, I think it's good that we should go over. But I would like to let everyone know that you can purchase Phyllis's book for $30, um, the link Belinda has put the link up on chat. So if you go to the link, it came up just in the last couple of minutes. Um, and so you can follow that link and you'll be able to get a copy of Phyllis's book for a, um, a great time, a great price. Sorry, Mary, I am I am aware that I'll hand over to you in a minute. Wow. I was meant to I was meant to say at the beginning, Jared Moore, who's the director of BBI Tate, um, sent his apologies. He's caught up with a, another group of um, doing um, a school and mission, I think it is. And so I, I said that I would make sure I'd offered his apologies and welcome to everybody. Um, and I saw Andrea put up, Andrea Dean put up a note saying the parish guide, what a great idea. So mm -hmm. I would encourage everyone to go to Phyllis's website and have a look at her parish study guide. Mm -hmm. And I will actually give the closing of this over to Mary so, Mary, can I hand over to you? Yeah, thank you, Anne. I've been sitting here nursing a drink and a toast, Phyllis, because uh, it takes a lot of effort to write a book and to have the commitment to do the research, to uh, struggle over the wording. And it is such a sensitive topic. And we want you and women like you to be called upon uh, to be on committees, to be on high level committees. And so sometimes you feel like you're walking a razor edge. So Phyllis, uh, it may not be time in Australia to raise a glass, but certainly <laughs> in your country it is. So I'd like to toast you, wish it every success. Uh, and in Melbourne, it's available through Garrett Publications. And wish you all the very best with it, Phyllis. Thank so, you very much. To you. Thank we, you. We could all show our reactions by raising a glass or... Aha. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining across the world. We think of you joining us from America tonight as you go into a very um, special time for you. And you've got our prayers and our thoughts going with you in the next few hours and from BBI Tate I would like to thank all of you for joining us it's been our absolute delight to host you all and may you go well and may your day go well good night everyone good day good day, good day. And, and just before just before you go my name's yes. Marilyn Hatton Marilyn and I, I reviewed this wonderful book oh Marilyn I'm sorry I didn't know we had a reviewer and I want, to, I want to thank Phyllis for just such a wonderful resource for all of us here in Australia who are working for equality for women and an inclusive practice of faith. So thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. It's time to leave now. I think so, Mary. I think we might all leave. Thank you all very much.